adolescence, a time of change. Often marked by bad decisions, it can be a rough uphill battle. It's been reported that young women are leaving the West for new lives in Syria, with many becoming the teen brides of terrorists. But is the media right? Are these girls being predated upon? Or are their decisions simply based in the naivete and recklessness of youth? Join the Honey Badgers as we discuss Jihadi Teen Brides. As always, the show will be available for download after the broadcast at HoneyBadgerBrigade.com. All right, uh, Jihadi Brides, victims, radicals, or rebellious youths. The phenomenon of young Western women leaving their homes to join ISIS is a growing concern for many in the UK and other parts of Europe. Furthermore, people cannot decide what to make of these girls' decisions. The media is claiming everything from sexual exploitation and brainwashing to women just wanting to join the Islamic State as radicals. With girls as young as 15, it's a wonder how anyone can compare their decisions to that of full-grown women. However, these young women are lured to radical Islam in the same way as young men are. It's often this romanticized ideal of an Islamic state, sold to impressionable young people who may be searching for their own identities. One undercover journalist claims that she posed as a young teen named Melody, who recently converted to Islam, and said that getting the attention of these men was easy. Having previously interviewed these girls who fled to Syria, she had this to say, quote, they knew very little about religion. They had hardly read a book and they learned to jihad before religion. They tell me, and, and this was in regards to um, the guy she was talking to, they tell me, you think, with, you think with your head, we think with our hearts. They had a romantic view of radicalism. I wonder how that happened, unquote. She reported that she soon gained the attention of what she believes to be a top ISIS commander by the name of, I'm going to butcher this probably, Abu Bilal, who sent her many messages and even a marriage proposal promising her a beautiful life, a big apartment, and lots of children. But this is only one method of recruitment. There are also other women who join all female militias in the Islamic State, ready to lay down their lives for what they believe is the greater good. Many young Muslim women are speaking out and feel that this is both a tragedy and an embarrassment. The feminists at The Guardian have a different take on this occurrence. They believe that the idea that radical Islam is targeting the youth is ridiculous, and that this is a conscious decision on the part of women who are still in their teens. While much of this idea of jihadi brides is based in hysteria, it is ridiculous to believe these young men and women are thinking consciously about their futures and aren't fueled by this romantic ideal of what radical Islam is for the young people that volunteer to come there. While these teens are not mindless zombies being controlled, they are also not being informed about the reality of their decision. They are being love-bombed as one would be in a cult, promising acceptance and the opportunity to take charge of their destiny. They view these terrorists as sympathetic individuals who are misunderstood and oppressed. Even so, the UK government is willing to take these women back with open arms, stating that they won't face terrorism charges, which cannot be said for the young men their age that would love to be given such a pass. Other countries are not so forgiving, with women sending messages saying that they made a mistake and wish to return, falling on deaf ears. The UK has since put a flight ban on young people suspected of Islamic radicalization with intent to join terrorist forces. But the question is, will such bans really be enough to combat this problem? Discuss. Well, <laughs> it's funny that, as you said, they, they're going to take back the women uh, with with open arms and pardons, but yeah. not the men, to once again reiterate the, the fact that, uh, you know, pretty much wars and all the rest of the suffering is, uh, you know, just trying to kill off as many poor young people men as we can but um anyway it's, it's interesting that um uh, i kind of read some things about isis and they they do prey on on children in the sense that there have been kidnappings of young boys or like teenage boys um in uh, middle eastern countries around that area and uh, there was like um interview series with with one of the kids and he was actually uh, even though he was kidnapped and held in a weird place with um 
all these other teenagers and then later returned and saw some beheadings and things like that he um, thought that isis was you know that they were like right that they were they were doing something good and uh, that does come from this fundamental uh dogma of the society which is uh, i mean i guess about uh, jihad and and infidels uh because they're like look you guys they're definitely romanticized they're like look guys they're just killing infidels that's all and it's like so they're obeying the rules that our religion or our government or whoever says that you know you're perfectly fine obeying these rules that's all they're doing they're staying within the rules so they're you know they're fine but um at the same time you can't really trust anyone anytime they say uh, uh, that someone's preying on on young white girls. It's like, oh wait a minute, <laughs> you gotta start watching out for um, some hateful uh, rhetoric that usually comes with that. Um, any kind of racist, um, uh, I guess, um, abuse is usually preambled with they're coming after you, women. So it's it's an interesting interesting thing that uh, it's kind of complex, but clearly we see that women are being favored. Um, and basically as like a different class of citizens uh, than men, even uh, in something um, that has to do with terrorism, universal hated thing. You know, I, I've been sitting here thinking about this ever since we, we uh, started talking about doing this topic. And I mean, the internet has been around as, as in its, as close to its current form for, for a couple of decades. We've been, you've been able to get online and, and learn things on the internet for a couple of decades. You've been able to communicate with people directly for a couple of decades. And parents haven't learned yet to teach their children stranger danger on the internet. They haven't learned to monitor what their kids are doing online. They haven't learned that, hey, there are predatory people out there that are, that are con artists and scam artists. And, and if you um, are, are, are trying to give your kid the benefit of the best possible parenting, part of your job is to teach them to spot a con and not fall for it. And then part of your job is that while they're kids, you watch out to fall, make sure they don't fall for a con. You know, where, where's, where are these kids' parents? You know, I, not that the kids are are completely 100% innocent in in you know reading things from these people and not thinking, well, hey, this is the same group that well, I'm I'm seeing on the news beheading people and and doing all these terrible things, and and making the association that maybe joining them isn't a good thing, but God, where the hell are their parents? Yeah, I, I agree. And in fact, I remember watching. No, sorry, not watching. I was reading you guys an need article. To agree less. Agree less. Well, no, no, <laughs> no. But, but what yeah, parents are bad. Yeah, parents, parents are horrible. Is... Nobody should have parents. Parents should be dumped in a ditch. I was going. Well, I was going to say that there was a guide to trying to keep your kids from. Um, from radical away from radicalization it was a message for muslim parents uh, and talking about what they need to do is they need to you know be good parents they need to you know make their their kids uh, feel understood and and loved and cared for because really this is you know the basis of all of this what the reason why these women go into this is not necessarily just because of you know the idea of they want to create an islamic state and so that that's you know that's sort of secondary what's really going on in all of this is the same thing that goes on in cults and in any kind of radicalization it, it's at, at its basis it's people th these young people who really have this desire to have attention to, to feel this sense of acceptance you know that that's really what this is actually about they they want to feel like adults they want to have this freedom and they believe that these people are going to give it to them and that's really the best recruitment tool say we're going to accept you we're going to understand you those people over there they don't understand you and and, and how are you supposed to be like the best uh, the best muslim you can be if you're not here fighting a good fight with us and and you're not um you know being being devout and, and, and pure and all of these things by, by coming over here and joining our holy war like you can come with with us and everything and you'll be able to drive cars and and you'll and we'll give you an apartment and we'll do all these wonderful things for you and and maybe you'll you'll find a nice husband and stuff like that i mean it's it, it's it's just really 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 it's kind of like taking a kid to a candy store you know what i mean um okay so what i wanted to talk about was is this idea that we actually practice a sort of a gender apartheid in our own culture um, it's almost like a, a, an invisible uh, Sharia law 
but it's almost reversed in that we completely erase the consequences of women's actions. I mean, because if you think about it, these these individuals are betraying the countries that they are part of, that they are citizens of, to go and fight for a really aggressive, violent cause um, or support it in some way, in a logistical way. Um, and these, and we do not see them we don't see that their actions is having consequence. When they, you know, we're just going to invite them back, roll out the red carpet, and let them come back. No jail, nothing. Because we just completely erase the consequences of their actions. We just say that they don't exist at all. And that's what this our society does: is essentially removes all marks that women leave on the world, in endeavors to erase in in its process of erasing consequence and agency from women. And if you think about it, it's like living in a world where you can touch nothing, you can do nothing, really. And, I mean, even if feminists come back and say, but we just protect women from the negative consequences of their actions, the negative consequences are what make the positive consequences meaningful. I mean, if you, without negative consequences, there are no positive consequences. They're just a vo aimless void. There's another aspect to this. When when you erase the immediate measurable to the person consequences of her actions, where where she is not going to suffer anything because of what she's done and on and if she does something bad, then you also take away the deterrent. And it is because of that that we end up uh, that we have ended up, I should say, with the society we have today where there are court cases that go on for years and years because of a woman ma making repeated false accusations against her ex-husband in an attempt to get custody back um, after after she's lost custody of their children or in an attempt to maintain custody. And she's not seeing the consequences of her actions impacting her. And so she has, unless she is a person with a conscience, unless she has a sense of accountability, she has no incentive to control herself and, and refrain from doing things that have consequences for other people. And if you think of it this way, um, it, I don't know how many of you live near a lake, but every year in the wintertime in, in the area where I grew up, the, the lake would freeze over. And looking at the lake, you couldn't tell how deep the ice was just from eye level. So if you were smart, you know, you, you looked for what the authority said, you know, don't go out on the ice, do go out on the ice, that kind of thing. Um, if you were, you were foolish, you looked at it and tried to judge for yourself. And if you wanted to be out on the ice, you went out there. Well, if you can't see the immediate consequences, if you can't see that you're going to get hurt if you go out and do something, chances are at some point you're going to go out and fall through the ice. And so the other aspect of that is that these women, um, and I mean, I know one personally um, that, that's like this, cannot have functional relationships in their lives because they do not have this capability of controlling their behaviors. They fall through the ice every single time. They they go out on the ice, they go out on a limb, they they exhibit these behaviors and and they break their connections with other people. They break their trust, they break their their ability to feel closeness and companionship with each other because of the things they've done. So even if it was not for for the right of women to, to have the same benefit of impact and, and, and sense of meaning as men in the world. The, the, the lack of consequences also has other impacts that are that are very, very damaging to oh, all of society. Yes, we want to erase consequences to women's actions so they retain, I guess, an, uh, a perfect, um, vestige of complete immobility, like complete um, reaction, complete acted upon. And in the process of attaining that, it's almost like a religious urge, um, in the process of attaining that, we it's an incredibly expensive thing because we have to then try to erase or deal with all of the consequences to other people of these women's actions, which we we will we allow women to take any action we want. We just erase the consequences to themselves, and uh, and pretty much blame men for the consequences to them, and blame kids for the consequences to them, and blame 
people who point out that women's choices are causing these social issues and we blame them and anybody but the woman themselves and in order to attain that that perfect um, vision of completely non-action, complete and utter static non-being that we seem to love to see women as, um, and unless we want to make them into some sort of waif who's like 90 pounds and beating up 250 pound women or men without getting a scratch on them, which is, I, I don't even understand, like that is such a, yeah, such no, a visual paradox, it's ridiculous. That's also, that's just, it's just again an erasure of consequences. Um, yeah, and, but but I, I want to just finish, I just want to finish, I want to finish. So this expensive way of erasing or creating this gender apartheid leaves us not able to punish women's consequences. And eventually, we're going to get to the point where we can no longer afford to purge the world of their consequences, to purge the, 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 the public sphere of the consequences of women's actions. So we're going to have to go back to the Sharia mo model of, uh, of um, preventing women from being able to do these things in the first place. So yeah. essentially feminists are hailed, heralding are by refusing to accept the issues that we're, we're presenting, the problems of not seeing women's consequences and not uh, enforcing them. Feminists are essentially the handmaidens of the kind of patriarchy we see in Islam because eventually the society is going to break. We're not going to be able to afford to continue to do this this way and we will have to continue to do it in the Sharia law, burqas, female only spaces, that kind of kind of gender segregation because we won't be able to afford it anymore. This is this is really what what it is. I mean like the the, the women under coverture, women under Sharia, they have consequences. They have consequences whether they did anything or not. Right, they, you know, essentially it is, it's like a set of preemptive consequences, right? Um, it's a preemptive thing, you know, you, you, you wear the burqa, you, you behave in this way, you absolutely have these rigid, rigid ways that you behave that, um, that impose a set of sort of almost uh, consequences in advance on your, you know, on any behavior that you might want to do, right? It's essentially a set of limitations, a set of restraints. Right, um, and and they're for the most part when you compare them to, you know, consequences of really egregious behavior uh, for men, most of those were very mild uh, in comparison. Right, you know, yeah. uh, where but, men would get hung. Right, um, women would be ostracized. Yeah, they they would well, or you would you would have this set of consequences imposed on you before you even acted. You you have to wear a burqa, right? But wearing a burqa in order to avoid this, that, and the other is uh, much milder than dying in prison or being executed, right? Um, which tends to happen to men who cross the line in those cultures. And so, I mean, like, you, you had this. They don't want those limitations. Feminists don't want those limitations on women, but they absolutely refuse to accept identical consequences to what men have. Um, when women are given identical autonomy, that that's really the thing. They 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 don't want. Um, I I would I would be absolutely one hundred percent on board with them if they said you know we want women to be treated exactly like men. We want women to suffer the exact same punishments as men. We want women to, but they don't. They don't. Right. They just want to remove every single burden off of women even the burden of the consequences of her own choices and decisions, even the burden of, you know, having to actually pay for her own things, her own decisions, her own life choices, right? Don't want that burden, right? And you, you see this in everything, in everything, right? You know, we have to give a year of maternity leave to women so that they can take time off, right? Well, what does that do? That, that ups the wage gap. Right, because you know, and then, then, oh my goodness, women are being victimized by maternity leave, right? Well, we can't get rid of maternity leave because getting rid of it would victimize women. So what do we, you know? So then we have Jessica Valenti saying maybe we should just pay women more than men, right? So that they won't ever have to suffer the consequences of their own choices, right? We have to make each choice as easy as possible. Make each choice, you know, something that. Any woman could go for, I can go back to work six weeks after my baby's born, or I can take a year off or two years off, right? And not, not suffer, not starve, right? But then 
that means that I'm a year behind all of my male colleagues and now they're earning more than me and this is a big problem. So now we have to, now we're going to have people suggesting that, hey, she should be just paid more because she's a woman and men should just be paid less because they're men. Yeah, one thing I did want to bring up though, and this is uh, not as much to do with women's agency as it is to do with the ridiculousness of the SJW attitude about Islam. Have you guys noticed that in any conflict where Islam comes up and, and they talk about terrorism and the fact that these people are, you know, they're beheading journalists, they're killing young boys, they're kidnapping girls, they don't fucking speak out against this because they see Islam as the underdog, as, as the oppressed uh, brown people, basically, as the oppressed people of color. And it, it's just so incredibly frustrating because you, you try to explain to them, like, this is, you know, this is this is incredibly fucked up, but they're always going to take that, that, that side, even though there are, are parts of Islam that are, that run counter to what they believe, especially when it comes to, uh, to, to homosexuality and, and, and gay rights and things like that. that. That's something that is completely forbidden in Islam. And yet these people, they're, they're just going to support Islam when, when it comes down to it, uh, no matter what, the, no matter what it is, uh, no matter what comes up, no matter what evidence comes to the contrary. And that's just yeah, baffling that evidence makes you an Islamophobe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's baffling to me how these people can just ignore it all. You know what, what? What that made me think of is the, the the thing I was working on earlier today, and when we were talking about before the show, demonizing men in in minority populated countries. That fem feminists demonize men in minor minority populated countries by by uh, highlighting female experiences of violence and ignoring male experiences of violence. And and here they will do that. They'll do that to the poor. Like, you know, they'll do that to farmers. They'll do that to people who are not, um, they're not trying to attack foreign countries. They're barely able to survive, some of them, in, in, in their environments. And they'll do it to people who are dealing with um, an evolution of their own culture from, from a, a, you know, a, a time when they were completely and totally ruled by a caste system to sort of stepping into a, 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 the 21st century and going through all these painful transformations, but they can't demonize a group that is committing noticeable, measurable, catastrophic violence against multiple areas of the world, multiple yeah, populations no. in the world. They even can't demonize radical. that. Even when it's radical, they won't come against these people uh, who, who are being, who are even uh, condemned by other people in the, in the Islamic community. Yeah. yeah. No, and, 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 and it's not just that. The only the only area where they're going to even remotely attack. Stop squeaking. The only area no, where they're going to remotely attack. Hannah, 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 Hannah was is, is for misogyny. That's the only that's the only angle that they ever come at it from. Yeah, that is. It's the only thing they ever say about Islam. They can't. They can't. Beheading men is perfectly acceptable, but God forbid you you give a woman any any uh, rules to follow that men you know don't have to follow identically. God forbid you uh, you know say well she can't drive a car be be out without a a. a uh, I can't think of it. Sensor is all I can think of yeah, now. It's all your fault, Allison. A chaperone out without a chaperone. But you know, you can cut off some, <laughs> saw off somebody's head with a knife, and 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 that's okay. You know, you can set somebody on fire and burn them alive, and that's not so bad. Because I mean, we got to be upset about the burqa. You know, the burqa is so much worse. It may not hurt, but I mean, it covers you up all the time, and fire's temporary, right? Oh yeah, and what's what's hilarious though is is that a lot of those things, a lot of those things like the burqa, are perpetuated by women in the culture. So it, it's it's essentially you know mothers telling their daughters you have to wear this, right? And you have to wear this uh, in in essence because if you don't, then unworthy men will be able to look at you. You will be victim of the dreaded male gaze, right? So I mean it, it's essentially really it, between feminists and Islam. It's essentially a decision on who's responsible, right? Are women responsible for covering up or are men responsible for gouging their own eyes out? That, that's really what it is. It, it's really protecting women from the gaze of unworthy men. And some cultures say that that's women's responsibility and some cultures say that it's men's responsibility. I mean, and you even look at the whole fucking driving thing 
in Saudi Arabia, right? Okay, 80, you know, some university professor did a poll and, and he found that 80% of women don't want the driving ban gone. 80% of women say they want the driving ban to stay. One of them said something along the lines of every woman in Saudi Arabia is like a queen and and sh there had damn well better be a man who want, who's going to drive her where she wants to go when she wants to go there. And, and another one said, you know, if women are allowed to drive, our husbands will have more opportunities for infidelity. Now, out of the 20% of women who support getting rid of the driving ban, that's not unconditional. That's not we want to be treated like men. No, they want separate lanes. They want separate fucking women-only lanes. And that's Do they have any concept of how much it would cost to build that? I know. Mm -hmm. And, okay. and holy they shit. built a freaking, they built an entire city. It's like, I think it was Saudi Arabia built an entire city just Jesus. for women. So women could be empowered and do all the things that they wanted to do. But without, well, well men would be well, there, but then. And all of that, yeah. Oh gosh. But <laughs> men would have to be there to do all of the, the maintenance work, but I guess they would be. Like going all <laughs> the mall. They would have like, like those, you know, you know, in, uh, in, um. Uh, Disney World, they have those tunnels underneath the ground where all the staff go. Mm. That's how the men would be. They would be in the tunnels while the men, women would be on the surface. And the men would have like little doors that they could do stuff in. They couldn't, I guess they would have to be blind too. So they could, could fix stuff, clean toilets, scrub toilets and, and other stuff. That, that really sounds like it. Like, it's a, a patriarchy. In a real city like that? Well, they 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 either proposed it or they built it. I don't know. I if, forget. If, I forget. I don't. I don't remember. I just following it. Yeah. Well, you do know that. Crap. Uh, you do know that there was like in the past there was actually a feminist terrorist organization. I think it was in Iran or Iraq. It was a, called Mech. A no. feminist terrorist organization. Well, there's probably more than one. The thing about it is, it's yeah. really difficult to track them down. Yeah, look up red stockings. Uh, yeah. No, no, I'm talking about actual Islamic. Oh, okay, <laughs> Islamic. And, and it, they were actually getting, they're actually getting uh, funded at one point by, I think, uh, feminist groups from the U.S. Yep. Believe oh it or not, it was, it was, and this happened. Oh God, it was way back, way back when. It, uh, I think it just banded, like instead of they they renounced violence in 2001. But yeah, they killed a lot of people. So when people say like, "Oh my God, women never get involved in these kinds of wars. They've never done anything like this. It's all the men." Yeah, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's just the whole. Oh yeah, but but if if women want to compete in a man's world and in a man's hierarchy, they have to become masculinized. So they're really not women anymore. They're just men with vaginas. Um, you know, like Margaret Thatcher was just a man with a vagina. And uh, and all of these women who and Indira Gandhi, Golda Meir, they, they're just men with vagina with, with vaginas. That's all they are because they had to learn, you know. And none of them ever actually look at the fucking causality, right? And and you know they think that this power structure, this hierarchy, was built to suit men. What they don't understand is the hierarchy exists no matter who's in it, and men just by you know biological reality right men seem to be better suited to competing within that particular form of hierarchy right you are never going to like just like with communism communism works in extended families it works beautifully it works like woe and like down because everybody cares about everybody else everybody loves everybody else we're all related to each other we just all really want to do you know everybody in the family to do well i'm willing to give give 100 percent that so that my child can can do well right and you know even if he didn't earn it yet okay because those are that's what kinship bonds are about and then they try and extrapolate the communist system to the entirety of civilization to a country of multiple millions of people and then they're telling me that somehow i have to care as much about some fucking random dude in buttfuck quebec right as much that i've never met as much as i care about my own child right and i'm supposed to be willing to put as many dollars on the line for that guy that i've never met halfway across a country of, of 35 million people, I'm supposed to care about him just as much as my own child. That does not work, right? And, okay. and this, this this is just, it, it just, oh. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, that's a little bit, I think I understand the connection there. I, I'm following the Karen train back to the source. You can't, and it's you, all you, you, you can't. 
So, yeah, human erasing sector. human nature. Although I wanted to make a comment on what you said about hierarchies. I think it's more that uh, you don't have generals without privates. You don't have a hierarchy without the men who are willing to sacrifice. And basically, basically, the hierarchy is built on their bodies and their sacrifice. Without them, you don't have a general. You don't have a CEO. Yeah. You don't have, a, you know, like you don't have these pe these men in high positions without the men under them who are willing to cooperate together to push them up. It, you cannot actually extract the top of the hierarchy and say, oh, well, men have the top of the hierarchy, and that's bad. You can't, because it's the top is actually an emergent property of the bottom. Well, I think, I think, um, I think to someone who views themselves as powerless, essentially. Um, or is marginalized, uh, a, an opportunity to act out with violence feels like power, right? That, that's really, uh, that's, I think, that a lot of the draw for these people is it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of people who tend to feel like they're sort of ineffectual in the life that they have now. Um, and what, what ISIS or any terrorist organization and a lot of cults, and, and a lot of that kind of stuff offers them is sort of an opportunity to feel effectual. It, it's yeah. an opportunity to feel like you're an effective human being. You're making things happen. Exactly. And we, in the West, uh, particularly women, I think they live in a complete void of consequences, like I was saying, saying earlier. And it might also explain why uh, they can't see that um, that men who are in power are an emergent property of the men who are willing to sacrifice and not, not necessarily sacrifice to be in power, but simply sacrifice to build something, to build something greater than themselves. That's an, you know, the people who, the men who are in charge of that are there because of all of the other men who are willing to sacrifice their personal self-interest to a certain degree to build something bigger than themselves. Okay, all right, <laughs> let's happened. end this thing. Okay, thank you to all my right. wonderful panelists. Thank you to Karen for being a good sport and doing this even while she is sick. And thank you to Anna and Hannah and... <laughs> Rachel, and thank, thanks also to uh, once again. I'm going to do a shout out to the Steam group. If you have, if you like games and you like Honey Badgers, and or even if you just like games, uh, consider going to our Steam group. Um, it is Honey Badger Radio Gamers with Bite, and uh, you can just go to Steam, put that in, and find the community. Anyway, well, again, thanks, thanks for listening. It's always a a fun trip. And good night. If you enjoyed the contents of this podcast please consider supporting our show. You can become our patron at www.patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio. This show is made possible by the contributions of listeners such as yourself. Thank you for your donation.